Ladies and gentlemen, how the heck are you? This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. I have a gourmet buffet for you today. What I'm going to share with you is mainstream. You just have to find it. Uh, this is on a variety of different websites and white papers are available. The Planet X discovery that the media forgot about and the mainstream astronomy programs. I'm going to share that with you here in just a minute in just a minute as well as what you're looking at next to me is the iris image details the interface region imaging spectrograph titled ni2b sounds like nibiru a little bit the n the i and the b nibiru and then it's titled to it's labeled the 2003 ub313 it was taken 1021 2003 and it wasn't released to the public until several years later then i'm going to share with you after that how first they said there was a discovery of a planetary sized object in the scattered kuiper belt i'm going to share with you the white papers and they say eh, it's just a bit bigger than pluto then after pluto is demoted there is a new planet discovered about the size of Jupiter that is actually causing the sun to tilt. And I'm going to share some information with you in a moment that makes it even more fascinating about how they are saying that this planet nine, because there's another planet, there's been planet X discovered, then they changed the name. Then planet nine was discovered. And the planet nine is actually, according to these white papers, causing the sun to tilt and it is at its furthest point in its orbit, the planet nine. So I find that very interesting. So I'm going to be sharing with you orbits. I'm going to be sharing with you white papers. I'm going to be sharing with you the observational constraints on the orbit and location of planet nine in the outer solar system. Planet nine is likely near aphelion, which means it's furthest distance from the sun, yet it's causing the sun to tilt. That just doesn't make sense to me. So at opposition, its motion, mainly due to parallax, can easily be detected within 24 hours due to the brightness and the telescope technology that's available. I'm going to share with you the orbit of Iris or Eris, a.k.a. Planet X. I'm going to share with you various articles written in 2005 that said Planet X was discovered. And this is after Planet X was discovered in the 80s and Planet X was discovered in the, you know, in the 40s and the 20s and and I mean, anyway, so orbit of planet nine and original Caltech planet X discovered website. I'm going to share that with you. The website that was created by a Caltech when they discovered this planet that they changed the name on. Now, on top of that, the Iris interface region imaging spectrograph website and brief description of the technology. If I have time, I'll get into that with you. I'm going to get into the biography, you know, the, the bio of Michael Brown, a.k.a. Planet Killer, Pluto Demoter. And I mean, very brilliant man. And then I'm also going to get into the reading translations from Sumerian cuneiform tablets and ancient Egyptian copper plates that reference the Sumerian dragon and Egyptian destroyer dragon written about in times of antiquity. And as a bonus for you, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to share with you the radiation levels towards the end of the program. If you'd like to know what the radiation levels are currently, I will be more than happy to share that with you. Now, I've left links in the video description box, so make sure to verify everything that I share with you via video link. And when I, one of the things that I find fascinating right now, what we're looking at, is this was discovered in 2003, this right here. And then in 2005... And you can, I'm leaving all the, all the details for you to look this up and validate this for yourself, okay? They didn't release this data to the public and actually classify it as a planet until several years later. And then they labeled it as Planet X. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I'm going to share it with you right now. I am not making this up. I'm going to turn off that. Okay, so you can see right here what you're looking at. These were the headlines in 2003, 2005, here we go. The Iris dwarf planet in our solar system discovered via Hubble telescope 
bigger than Pluto. Look at this right here. UB313.com, the 10th planet is discovered. Now, then you might ask yourself the question, what really classifies something as a planet? Because a scientist on the right is going gonna, is gonna to have certain parameters, and then the scientist over in the, you know, in the other community, in another camp, in, a, in another university, another set of print rules to create a planet, they're going to have a completely different opinion on the planet. So who's right? Is it the mainstream community because they have more people that are – working underneath them, underneath the schooling system and the education system and the indoctrination system and the financial system that funds those systems that says, oh, we don't have enough money to fund this new opportunity, so we're just going to keep this original story as the official story that we're going to teach in school and tell everybody's the truth. And if, ever, if anybody else doesn't believe it, we'll call them conspiracy theorists because we made that story up anyway. We made anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, you guys know I don't follow the official version of Zachariah Sitchin Planet X 3600-year doom theory. I don't buy it, okay? I haven't found the evidence yet. I have found evidence of 5,500-year cycles of asteroid doom. I have found evidence for there being a 10th planet, but there's plenty of planets out there, so to say there's not a planet 10 is ridiculous. That's like saying the only planets that exist are in our solar system, and the same kind of people that say that are usually the same kind of people that say the Earth is a hologram and the solar system isn't real anyway. And, you know, this is all just in our, totally in our imagination. I mean, beyond just in our imagination. Because, yes, it is a fragment of our imagination, yet also perception is reality. And, you know, I'm sitting on a chair right now. I'm not flying around and I'm not driving a Ferrari and I'm not, you know, out in Moab, Utah, mountain biking on the Red Rock with a, a jet pack next to me and stuff like that. That would be you know, fully in my imagination if I wanted to go that route. But let's, let's go back to the discovery of this 10th planet because I know I'm divigating here. And you can see multiple websites. The Astronomy Source right now, 2003, UB313, Planet X from Caltech, Mike Brown. The discovery. This guy is all over the place. I mean, he's, he's discovered and demoted all sorts of planets. Now, here's another one. Direct measurement of the size of 2003, UB313. This is the actual white paper. Let's get into some of the white papers now. I'm going to share this with you. Here is the original white paper from 2005. You can read about this if you want to. Once again, the links will be in the video description box. Discovery of a planetary-sized object in the scattered Kuiper belt. Now, when this was published in 2005, this was two years after the discovery of this specific planet. And I'm going to share with you the orbit as well. So if we look at the orbit, should be, well, actually, you know what? I'll share with you the orbit in just a minute. So let's, let's go back up here. Let me read this to you. Let me read this to you. Sometimes I go kind of fast. We present the discovery and initial physical and dynamical characterization of the object 2003 UB313. The object is sufficiently bright that for all the reasonable values of the albedo is certain to be larger than Pluto. Pre-discovery observations back to 1989 are used to obtain an orbit with extremely small errors. The object is currently at aphelion in what appears to be a typical orbit for a scattered Kuiper Belt object, except that is inclined by about 44 degrees from the ecliptic. The presence of such a large object at this extreme inclination suggests that high-inclination Kuiper Belt objects form pref uh, preferentially closer to the sun Observations from Gemini Obser um, Observatory show that the infrared spectrum is like that of Pluto and 2005 FY9. Now, what's interesting, once again, is they've titled this with three letters, letters that are in Nibiru. It doesn't mean it's Nibiru. I'm not saying that it's Nibiru. But check this out. This is the more recent paper that was published February 2016 of the new discovery of the what they call Planet 9 in the astronom um, astronomy communities. Planet 9, this thing is actually causing the sun to tilt. And in this paper, what I will share with you is it actually mentions how currently it is in its furthest point from the distance of the sun. So if that's the case, why would it be causing more of a tilt when it's at its furthest distance? I don't know enough about the laws of physics and gravity to explain that in detail. What I can share with you is right here, and once again, the link in the video description box, right here you can see the orbits of these different planets. And you can see the sun there, you know, it looks like the eyeball, and you can see multiple planetary objects and multiple orbits 
And here's one thing that I find fascinating. I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of planets outside the Kuiper Belt. And what happens when they get closer to our planet? I don't think they're going to hit our planet by any means. By any means. But what happens when all these larger objects start showing up and appearing within a certain proximity? Now, right there, it says they're very far away. I mean, as you can see, they are a long way away. You're talking 250 astronomical units at some point. That's 250 times the distance of the sun. That's a long way away. And even being that distance, that far away, they're still causing the sun to tilt, according to the documents. Now, let me read this to you real quick. The observational constraints on the orbit and location of Planet 9 in the outer solar system. This is what I just was talking about with you guys. Planet 9 is likely near Aphelion, with an approximate brightness of 22 to 25 V. That is an astronomical term of the brightness at up, I think. <laughs> I don't know exactly what that means, but that sounded good. So correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll be more than happy. You know, let me know exactly what that term means. What I can tell you, what I do know, is what it says right here, is that it's likely near Aphelion, which means it's at its furthest point from the sun, and it's still causing the sun to tilt. And the reason I think that is in reference to the brightness is because it says the approximate brightness of 22 to 25. That would just, that's what, when am I, I'm, anyway. Nanu, nanu. So its motion, mainly due to parallax, can easily be detected within 24 hours. And this is from Michael Brown once again. He's also got a really cool website you should check out. Here are the orbits. I want to share with you the orbit of Iris. You can see here, you can see how far away it is. I don't know how the stream's coming in, you guys. Are we doing okay? More fear porn. Uh, yeah, this... Uh, who, who am I scared? Are you scared? Are you, are you scared because I'm talking about planets? Well, if you're scared and you're in the chat room and you're, and you're scared about me talking about planets, then I would suggest you go watch Barney and Friends because I guess you can't have an adult conversation without freaking out. Um, First of all, didn't I just say that I don't think that there's going to be any cataclysms on the earth, but I say it is causing something to tilt a little bit, which is verified in these white papers? You know, w will somebody just tell that donkey to leave, please? Thank you very much. I'm divagating once again. I mean, look at the ignorance of people, you guys. I mean, what is wrong with people? Are people really that freaked out that somebody talks about these planets that aren't, you know, that are outside of the Kuiper belt and they automatically have an NLP moment and they're, they're triggered to like freaking out and going on this paranoia rant and talking about how you're freaking them out because you're talking about another planet? I mean, come on. Anyway, let's move on. All right. So here is the orbit of Iris. As you can see, it's still a long way away. And once again, I don't think you're going to have to go out and buy a bunker because of this planet. Now, is it a good idea to have a bunker due to other possibilities? Heck yeah, it is. But I'm not saying that you need to go buy a bunker because of this planet X. Okay, so let's take a look at this for a minute. The orbital period is 557 years, according to these orbit charts right here. Here is something else you can look at. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. Here's an image you can look at okay, now we're going to get into the uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this dwarf planet Iris it's the most massive and second largest dwarf planet known in the solar system it is also the ninth most massive known body directly orbiting the Sun how is that fear porn and the largest known body in the solar system not visited by a spacecraft well maybe it is a spacecraft it is measured to be I'm joking or am I maybe there's truth in humor right there so it's measured to be big it's 27 percent more massive than the planet Pluto and this thing is a lot smaller than planet 9 so let's get into the website that I just said I was going to share with you guys this is the Caltech website that looks like it was made when the internet was created you know 20 years ago but it looks like it's from see the date right here oh here's the date here's the date of the images 2003 October 21st yet it's very difficult to find in the public realms until several years later and you know let's go back again and let's take a look at this image I want to take a look at this image and share this with you guys what it looks like you can see that that is the iris image 
So once again, what does IRIS stand for? Is IRIS an Anunnaki alien shapeshifter? No, IRIS is not an Anunnaki alien shapeshifter. It means image, sorry, interface region imaging spectrograph. And once again, this image is titled NI2B2003 UB313 taken 10-21-2003. Now, let's add to this. First, Planet X is discovered. And okay, for, for those of you that are saying, I am, I'm giving you fear porn here because you're so scared because you had to leave Barney for a minute. Um, I'm gonna go back to the actual websites, the, you know, what are considered mainstream websites. Okay, let, let's jump back here for a moment. Let me uh, move these windows around. Here you go. Okay, if you need somebody to hold your hand, let me know. You know, let me know when you're ready. Okay, do, do you need a hug? Do you need a hug? Okay, here you go. 2003, UB313, 10th planet is discovered. Oh my gosh, that's fear porn, man! 2003, UB313, universe today. Okay, new planet, Caltech, GPS, Planet X discovered. You know, this was a few years ago. And it's just amazing how quick the public forgets. And they're like, oh no, Planet X, that's fear porn. You're talking about another planet. Oh my goodness. Okay, well, you know, relax, buddy. You know, let's, let's go back to the white paper of the discovery of this planet. You can read all about it. Read all about it. Read all about it. Here's the orbit of the newer Planet 9. I'm just going to give you guys an update for those of you that are just joining us here at youtube.com slash clandestine time lord here at the live feed. It's also going to be available for those of you that didn't have a chance to join us at the beginning. You can listen to the podcast on our YouTube channel and website leakproject.com. Now, another observation that I want to make again to those of you that are just joining us. Why are they discussing the implications of Planet 9 and how it's affecting the sun at its furthest distance from the sun. Is there somebody smarter than, me that can, smarter than me that can explain it? I'm sure there is. Take another look at this image here. Okay, there is a moon. I don't, I don't know why this is taking us to moons now. Let's go back to Iris here. The dwarf planet that was discovered. Look at this. Here's Caltech's website, the 10th planet, largest known dwarf planet, caltech.edu. Oh my goodness. I guess they're doing fear porn too. Now, this is the Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph website. You can look at it for yourself. Beautiful. Look at this. Oh my goodness, is that Planet X? No, that's Mercury. But I still think it looks pretty cool. That's what Mercury looks like. It's pretty darn close to the sun. You know, maybe some of those images that you've seen before of a planet that looks like it might be Planet X, well, maybe that's actually Mercury. I don't know. Here's Mr. Michael Brown. Let me get a drink here. All right. That's really vodka. No, I'm just joking. Michael E. Brown, an American astronomer who has been a professor of planetary astronomy at the California Institute of Technology since 2003. His team has discovered many trans-Neptunian objects, TNOs, notably the dwarf planets Iris, the only known TNO more massive than Pluto. Well, since then, we've had the opportunity to learn about Planet Nine, and there's a whole bunch of these other um, planets that I'm going to share with you in a minute, some different orbits of large planets. Let's go find that here real quick. All right, so where is that? Well, while I am looking for this, just want to make sure that, okay, we've got... Now, to, to cross-reference, I want to cross-reference the actual... I want to cross-reference this image right here with some Sumerian texts that I have been able to pull out of the Oxford University's treasure trove of trans, um, translated ancient Mesopotamian Sumerian cuneiform tablets. Just incredible. I found some really good information on Nibru as well as some of the nemesis type traits and let me read that to you guys now. I think this is quite fascinating here as well. 
Okay, where are we at? All right, I'm going to have to bear with me here just one second. Pulling up right now. Dang it. Where did it go? Where did it go? There we go. Found it. Here it is. A TG to Ninurta for Solji, Solji T. Cuneiform Tablet 2.4.2.20. Lord Perfect Warrior, beloved by Ninurta. Mace Tree with a broad shining canopy. They're describing what they're seeing in the heavens, I think. Weapons standing into battle. Foreign countries. A dragon with a terrifying face. Venomous snake who, blank, it's venom against the rebel lands. Overpowering, something missing there, foremost lion. Ninurta who, with the great prince Enki, my king, in your city shrine, Nibiru. Isumisa. Where for you, Lord, the, ki the kingship is perfect for you, perfect with you, blank advisor. The dragon, the dragon of the land, blank Ninurta, the great wall of Nibiru, my king whose divine powers cannot be scattered, warrior, forceful lion, blank, something missing there, king with the broad wisdom of heaven, so king with the broad wisdom of heaven and earth, Exalted scepter rising above the land. Ninurta, who? Missing something. The enemy lines missing. So are they describing a cosmic planet of some sort or some type of you know, ex explosion in the, in, the, in the stars, in the solar system? What are they describing there? And you know, when you get into the Sumerian star maps that I recently did here on Leak Project. If you didn't have a chance to watch that, I would just check it out. Watch it for a few minutes because it shows you how accurate the Sumerians were with astronomy, with record keeping. They had a perfect planisphere, astrolobe, which is a astrological unit. Uh, it's an astrological tool that is designed to keep track of the stars. And they were able to verify to the date a specific comet slash asteroid that was written about in prophecies in Sodom and Gomorrah. Pretty fascinating. So with, with all of that being said and with the description that I just gave you in the Sumerian cuneiform tablet, now I'm going to read to you something out of the... Um, the Colbrin Bible, which I thought was interesting because I just, like, this was literally, I just, when I, sometimes when I get in these large books that I just pick up, or even older books that I have that I've already read and I want to just kind of tap into it, I will just, I will pull open the book, I will, you know, I'll find a page and not even, you know, just open, okay, that's the page, okay, what is that? And then it'll, nine out of ten times, it's in reference to something that I was going to look up anyway. It's like, boom, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to find. That's, that's sinking right up with what I was going to talk about anyway. Well, that's what happened in this Colburn Bible. So this is chapter 3, Destruction and Recreation. It is known, and the story comes down from ancient times, that there was not one creation, but two, a creation and a recreation. It is a fact known to the wise that the earth was utterly destroyed once and reborn on a second will of creation. At the time of the great destruction of earth, God caused a dragon from out of heaven to come and encompass her about. The dragon was frightful to behold. It lashed its tail. It breathed out and fire and hot coals and a great catastrophe was inflicted upon mankind. The body of the dragon was wreathed in a cold bright light and beneath on the belly was a ruddy a ruddy hued glow while behind it trailed a flowing tell of smoke it spewed out cinders and hot stones and its breath was foul and stenchful poisoning the nostrils of men its passage caused great thunderings and lightnings to rend the thick darkened sky all heaven and earth being made hot the seas were loosened from their cradles and rose up pouring across the land there was an awful shrilling trumpeting which outpoured or outpowered even the bowling 
of the unleashed winds. And then there's a whole bunch more doom and, you know, I mean, a lot more doom. Um, but it pretty much says the same thing. And then it says here, when the light of the sun pierced the Earth's shroud, I mean, is it talking about the ozone, big hole in the ozone, bathing the land in revitalizing glory, the Earth again knew night and day. Oh, for there was, for there were now times of light and times of darkness, the smothering canopy rolled away and the vaults of heaven became visible to man. The foul air was purified and new air clothed the reborn earth, shielding her from the dark, hostile void of heaven. So I guess it sounds like that's when it's re rebuilt and things get to be good again. So there you have it. I mean, we've got some incredible footage right here of the Planet X, which looks very similar to the Anunnaki depictions that you see in the Sumerian tablets. And now remember, the Anunnaki are called the Akkadians as well. So if somebody says, oh, the Anunnaki are not real, say, oh, okay, I meant to say the Akkadians. And they'll say, oh, okay, that's better. Now, you know, that's another thing because there's just those little letters and stuff that can be oftentimes taken out and, and misrepresented. And so, okay, well, that has an extra I in it. So it can't be what we're talking about. Or, oh, that's got two extra letters. That is done, well, I mean, obviously, because over periods of time, I mean, just listen to my translations. I get things wrong all the time, and, and people get things wrong. But then, when you figure that out, and there's also, obviously, an orchestrated design to keep us suppressed and, and obviously, docile to the enlightenment and the opportunity of ourselves. But, you know, I mean, that brings me back to the Gnostic text, you guys. You read those Gnostic texts, and I just love how the Nag Hammadi treaties and those scriptures that were heavily suppressed by the Vatican and other institutions and almost completely destroyed. I love the meaning that they have and the way that they talk about humanity and how we're so much greater than we're often led to believe. And then you get into the first creation of Adam, like the first copy of human. And he was a badass. I mean, that guy was literally bulletproof. That guy was a Superman type being at least according to these prophecies and these texts. And then after the engineers realized that, what did they do? They did everything they could to suppress him. And then I read to you the Revelation of Adam, that highly suppressed book of the Gnostics. And what did it say? It talked exactly about how Adam and Eve, after they gave knowledge to others, that their creator wanted them dead. And he was going to go after them. You remember that? Doesn't that just freak you out? I mean, think about that for a minute. That's like saying... If you really think about that, that would be like a somebody that has a chicken farm, you know, and, and he just he's got thousands of chickens inside of this chicken coop that can never even see light. And he's making a profit off of those chickens and he's doing as much as he can to make them as big as possible by putting extra, you know, steroids and growth hormones in the feed and stuff like that. And maybe Maybe then you've got some mad scientist that like even creates these beans, right? That like literally genetically modifies these chickens to where they have a pineal gland like we do. So these chickens can walk around and actually do a little bit of work too. But they don't have too much of a lifespan, right? They'll be walking around like, quack, 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 quack. Can I get you chicken? Quack, 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 quack. And then they'll just start killing themselves. Like, doo, 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 doo. And they'll be like, okay, there's your dinner. You know, that's what the, <laughs> oh my goodness. Why did that just come into my mind? That's terrible. But just think about it, man. I mean, they've already genetically modified these chickens. We've been genetically modified for thousands of freaking years. So it's like, who made who? You know, where does the apex start? You know, who's really at the top of the food chain? I remember, okay, I'll, I'll share this story with you. It's, it's sad, but funny at the same time, but really it's sad. I shouldn't even be laughing about it because it's really sad. This chicken was, uh, okay, so my friend that lives in the Northwest, I haven't talked to him in a while. He was behind a chicken truck that had an opening in the back and he could see these chickens that just looked like they were deformed. They were missing, they were missing like feathers and they were, they were like featherless and they didn't, you could, you could tell they were chickens, but they were genetically modified chickens. And this one was like, like got out of the cage, like partially, it's partially in the cage. And it was to where it was so close to, if it would get out of the cage and, and another another truck would be able to hit it or another vehicle would hit it going the opposite direction on the road. So this chicken would wait until a vehicle would come by and then it would like open the, the door to the cage and like fling itself out and hoping that one of, those, one of those trucks would like hit it. 
it was trying to commit suicide. So every time a truck would go by the other way, it would fling itself out. And he said it was just the most disgusting thing he ever saw. And then I remember seeing that article in Wired Magazine several years ago about how they wanted to create these vertical chicken farms and genetically modify chicken to where they didn't have eyeballs so they couldn't see what was being done to them. And they weren't going to be able to fill anything. And it looked like something out of the Matrix. I mean, it was just disgusting. So who's to say that they don't just genetically modify these, you know, these chickens to start going around just like, you know, being their new servants. You know, we've been too much hassle for them. You know, Adam was too difficult. Seth was too difficult. You know, anybody that thinks for themselves can be too difficult. So maybe the idiocracy way of life, you know, the, the 50 IQ mindset because you're just dilapidated in your own ignorance and you're falling into the oblivion of fluoride and genetically modified E. coli feces, that is the future of the new world order. That is your future generations, ladies and gentlemen. Think about that for a minute. How do you feel about that? How do you feel knowing that you're paying good money that you work hard for to be suppressed? Doesn't that feel good? Don't you like knowing that they love us so much that they've depleted 76% of the atmosphere with these stratospheric aerosol injections? And you know what, guys? There might be something to them hiding something. And I'll tell you why. I just read, again, the Geoengineering Act of 2017, a bill that's being hopefully, that's hopefully going to be passed, that's being presented in the state of Rhode Island. And it discusses these multiple applications for stratospheric aerosol injections, chemtrails, chemical trails, potato, potato, tomato, tomato. And guess what? The, they've got this one application that is designed to cover the entire planet. And you can read about it directly from your representatives, ladies and gentlemen. You conspiracy theorists. You conspiracy theorists, ladies and gentlemen. They don't exist. They're not real. Can you believe there's still people out there that cling to that, that say in the comment section that there's no such thing as stratospheric aerosol injections? And, oh, well, they've talked about doing it, but they're just doing it little bits here and there. And, you know, I mean, everything else is just from regular commercial airlines or somebody going from point A to point B. Just because there's hundreds of patents of chemical trails doesn't mean it's real. It's fake anyway. I mean, hello? I mean, really? Are those people even real? Do you ever wonder that if they're just like, you know, they're, they're like, talk about the Borg. They're like, yes, I will do whatever you tell me, master. I will tell people there is no such thing as chemtrails on my computer. Ha, ha. And meanwhile, the earth is being destroyed and you've got people fighting over whether the earth is flat, square, pyramid-shaped, diamond-shaped, or round. Really? Take 1% of that energy, ladies and gentlemen, and do something about it if you care about your family, your friends, and your future generations. And once again, I need to remind you, the mind is mightier than the pen, and the pen is mightier than the sword. So use your mind. Use your head. Now, with that note... I have given you the keys to change your destiny to an extent, to an extent. Your destiny is, some people say predestined, but there's things you can do on the way to improve or make things worse. It's like those stories that used to be offered in the 80s. Now I'm showing my, my age here. I'm almost 40 years. Well, at least in this body, at least I think. Anyway, I'm divagating, and these stories you could read and they give you multiple choices. You know, the story was already written. The story's already written, ladies and gentlemen, yet you have different choices. It's like you get to the end of this hallway, and in this story, you're in this hallway, and you've got choice A. There's a door right in front of you. It looks nice, you know, I mean, the door looks like it's been recently opened, and it's got these nice engravings on it of like um, happy unicorns and elves and treasures and rainbows and and you know th just these happy things that you would see in like an old legend movie or something like that when Tom Cruise finds the treasure trove of of relics so that he can go fight off Lucifer which is actually the father of Satan and oh, actually he fights Satan I'm sorry because Satan is the son of Lucifer in this film remember the unicorn he has to get the unicorn horn back well, you've got that first door to choose from, ladies and gentlemen. You could pick that door in front of you and open that door. Or to the left, you've got this wood door that's got these rusty, you know, like a, like a rusty doorknob. 
and, and, and it looks like it hasn't been open in ages. It's got cobwebs around it. And, you know, there's this weird stench coming out from underneath it. And then to the right, there's like this button you can push and it's an elevator, right? And you're like, well, do I want to go on the elevator? And then you can choose if you want to go up or down on the elevator. But then you're like, well, do I want to go on the elevator or do I want to go in the treasure room? Or do I want to go in the room that doesn't look like it's been open in a long time? There's cobwebs around it and it's got this weird stench and weird noise that's coming out. What do I do? Which door do you choose? Now, each door will take you to a different place, yet it's already been written. So that is the analogy. So you're like, I'm going to go in the treasure room. I want the treasure room. Now, please leave a comment in the comment section. Which room do you choose? Do you choose the, the room in the center? Do you choose the room on the right of, or the elevator on the right? Or do you choose the door to the dungeon? And so most people would probably choose the treasure room, right? So, and then, so you open that door and boom, it's a trap. All of a sudden there's like this, this freaking giant flame that goes whoosh. And then all of a sudden, you know, this, this freaking club with all these, um, you know, poison tipped nippies comes out and just freaking bam. And, and, you know, then you have to start, start over again, right? That's the end. That's the end of that chapter. You got to start back over at the beginning of the chapter right there. Sometimes you even have to start back like, five, six chapters back and get back to that position. It's the same thing. Well, what, okay, so we've already decided that the bad door is the one that you thought was the treasure. So you're like, okay, well, I don't think I want to go in that dungeon. I think I want to go in that elevator. So you go in the elevator. And then you get in the elevator, right? And all of a sudden the elevator music's good. And you, you, you're starting to jam out. You're like, man, this is great. And the elevator starts taking you up this building. And then all of a sudden you see all these, these windows around you. There's these golden windows and you're seeing all these other skyscrapers and, and all these beautiful things. And you know, you're even seeing this, this bird that's flying next to you. It's like, and then all of a sudden the bird like transforms into this, like into this demon that's got these fangs. And it's like, it's like, and it just like freaking starts smashing its head into the window and then it breaks in. And then all of a sudden the freaking cords break on the elevator and then you fall to your demise. And you have to start over from the beginning as a worm this time. Now, the least chosen room probably would have been the dungeon room. But what happens when you open up that room? Well, you open up that room to the dungeon. And then you see this dark hallway that goes down these stairs. And you hear these strange noises. And you can even see, like, you can see what looks like snakes in the background. And you can see these, these black, like, shadows moving from place to place. But towards the end, you see, you see, like, what looks like this, like, gold treasure or something. So, so you just go down, you go down there and you, you weather the storm. And he's got this weird smells and noises. But you get there and then there's this light and you turn on the light. And then all of a sudden you realize you're just around a whole bunch of treasure. And you're like, woo, I got the treasure. I got the mother load. So choose your path wisely. The, the paths may already be predestined. Where am I going with this? The paths may already be predestined for you, yet you can choose which path to take. So choose wisely. Do you choose the path of ignorance? Do you choose the path of knowledge? Do you want to know? So I'm still not convinced that planet X is going to cause havoc to this planet. Yet I think that we've done enough to this planet already that we've already caused enough havoc right now. Like, for example, we don't even need to get into the 449 nuclear reactors. We don't need to get into the nuclear submarines that are at the bottom of the ocean, you know, uh, leaking radioactive isotopes with a half million year shelf life. We don't need to discuss the hundreds of thousands of fracking sites that are pulling the blood of the earth out of the ground. You know, we don't need to discuss the dumbing down of the human beings and the suppression of our consciousness with fluoride in the, in the water and aluminum being sprayed in the atmosphere. There's enough out there to know that we have already created the polarity here on Earth. But let's get back into these giant stratospheric aerosol injection um, blanketing that they're doing that's absolutely verified. What are they blocking besides the sun? And why are they having to blanket the entire planet to block the sun to change the degrees by just a few, to change the temperature by just a few degrees? Maybe they are hiding something. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a planet. 
It could be all the space junk they've got out there. It could be it could be different space weapons and different um, ships and flying saucer type technology. Maybe they're using it to do different frequency weapon warfare to manipulate the masses minds. Maybe there's something even more sinister like the Emerald Tablets of Toth discuss that there's things behind the scenes controlling human beings in high positions and places of power, oftentimes without them even knowing that because we've been told so many lies, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you for being here with me. I am uh, very appreciative of all of you. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Also make sure to check out leakproject.com. We have an exclusive uh, section there for premium members with content only available for premium members. So thank you, have a beautiful day, question everything, and be the change you wanna see. share with you the orbit of iris or iris aka planet x i'm going to share with you various articles written in 2005 that said planet x was discovered and this is after planet x was discovered in the 80s and planet x was discovered in the you know in the 40s and the 20s and and all, i mean anyway so orbit of planet nine and original caltech planet x discovered website i'm going to share that with you the website that was created by a Caltech when they discovered this planet that they changed the name on. Now, on top of that, the Iris Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph website and brief description of the technology. If I have time, I'll get into that with you. I'm going to get into the bio, you know, the, the bio of Michael Brown, AKA Planet Killer, Pluto Demoter. And I mean, very brilliant man. And then I'm also gonna get into the reading translations from Sumerian cuneiform tablets and ancient Egyptian copper plates that reference the Sumerian dragon and Egyptian destroyer dragon written about in times of antiquity. And as a bonus for you, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to share with you the radiation levels. Ladies and gentlemen, how the heck are you? This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. I have a gourmet buffet for you today. What I'm going to share with you is mainstream. You just have to find it. Uh, this is on a variety of different websites and white papers are available. The Planet X discovery that the media forgot about and the mainstream astronomy programs. I'm gonna share that with you here in just a minute, in just a minute. as well as what you're looking at next to me is the iris image details the interface region imaging spectrograph titled ni2b sounds like nibiru a little bit the n the i and the b nibiru and then it's titled to it's labeled the 2003 ub313 it was taken 10 21 2003 and it wasn't released to the public until several years later then I'm going to share with you after that how first they said there was a discovery of a planetary sized object in the scattered Kuiper belt. And the scientist on the right is going to is going to have certain parameters. And then the scientist over and, you know, in the other community, in another camp, in a, at another university, another set of print rules to create a planet. They're going to have a completely different opinion on the planet. So who's right? Is it the mainstream community because they have more people that are working underneath them, underneath the schooling system and the education system and the indoctrination system and the financial system that funds those systems that says, oh, we don't have enough money to fund this new opportunity. So we're just going to keep this original story as the official story that we're going to teach in school and tell everybody's the truth. And if, ever, if anybody else doesn't believe it, we'll call them conspiracy theorists because we made that story up anyway. We made anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, first of all, you guys know I don't follow the official version of Zachariah Sitch and Planet X 3600-year doom theory. I don't buy it, okay? I haven't found the evidence yet. I have found evidence of 5,500-year cycles of asteroid doom. I have found evidence for there being a 10th planet, but there's plenty of planets out there, so to say there's not a planet 10 is ridiculous. That's like saying the only planets that exist are in our solar system, and the same kind of people that say that are usually the same kind of people that say the Earth 
is a hologram and the solar system isn't real anyway. And, you know, this is all just in our, totally in our imagination. I mean, beyond levels towards the end of the program. If you'd like to know what the radiation levels are currently, I will be more than happy to share that with you. Now, I've left links in the video description box, so make sure to verify everything that I share with you via video link. And when I, one of the things that I find fascinating right now, what we're looking at, is this was discovered in 2003, this right here. And then in 2005, and you can, I'm leaving all the, all the details for you to look this up and validate this for yourself, okay? They didn't release this data to the public and actually classify it as a planet until several years later. And then they labeled it as Planet X. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I'm going to share it with you right now. I am not making this up. I'm going to turn off that. Okay, so you can see right here what you're looking at. These were the headlines in 2003, 2005. Here we go. The Iris Dwarf Planet in our solar system discovered via Hubble Telescope bigger than Pluto. Look at this right here. UB313.com, the 10th planet is discovered. Now, then you might ask yourself the question, what really classifies something as a planet? Because I share with you the white papers, and they say, eh, it's just a bit bigger than Pluto. Then, after Pluto is demoted, there is a new planet discovered about the size of Jupiter that is actually causing the sun to tilt. And I'm going to share some information with you in a moment that makes it even more fascinating about how they are saying that this planet nine, because there's another planet, there's been planet X discovered, then they changed the name. Then planet nine was discovered. And the planet nine is actually, according to these white papers, causing the sun to tilt. And it is at its furthest point in its orbit, the planet nine. So I find that very interesting. So I'm gonna be sharing with you orbits I'm going to be sharing with you white papers. I'm going to be sharing with you the observational constraints on the orbit and location of Planet 9 in the outer solar system. Planet 9 is likely near Aphelion, which means it's furthest distance from the sun, yet it's causing the sun to tilt. That just doesn't make sense to me. So at opposition, its motion, mainly due to parallax, can easily be detected within 24 hours due to the brightness and the telescope technology that's available. I'm going to